everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter. And if you're listening to us on audio only, I'd appreciate you rating and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen to it. And of course, if you like what I do here, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube and hit that bell for notifications. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for Kung Fu Genius fans. Right now, you can get an all access one month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to WCINewsstand.com and register in the upper right hand corner, fill in your email and password and use the code KFG trial to get your free trial to the issues from 2011 to the current issue. That's right, all the issues, even the one with this guy on the cover. My Kung Fu Genius column is in all the new issues as if you need another reason to get this awesome magazine. Go get your free trial subscription today. For all that information, check out the description below. And with that, let's get started. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube, lots of gems, Lots of choy lei fat, lots of, yo, I got the secret Yip Man's death touch book from under his bed, you wanna see? Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu genius. And every day I practice martial arts. <laughs> what, 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 Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm Gucci, Sifu. That's Gucci fantastic. Gucci. So, uh, by the way, uh, I don't know, you probably didn't see because you never watch anything I'm on. All right, we're at that point in the relationship now. <laughs> Charles Damiano, who I had on this I show. I got to see the first 15, 20 minutes. Oh, first, it's only 28 minutes long, <laughs> you <laughs> SOB. <laughs> <laughs> I got to see the first 15, 20, it's 28 minutes. I got to see the shit eating cereal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. So on the Charles Damiano channel, a uh, good friend of ours, he was on the podcast. We did the Collectibles uh, episode with him. Um, I was on his podcast, and or his YouTube channel, I should say. And uh, we did a long-form interview, and he's basically chopped it up into three parts. Mm. And so as of this recording, uh, part one is out. Probably by the time this episode comes out, at least part two should be out, maybe even part three. So for, um, you know, if you just cannot get enough of the Kung Fu Genius and you want to listen to my silky voice even more, uh, you can uh, check out uh, Charles Damiano's channel. Yeah. And of course, don't forget to uh, subscribe to him as well. Um, somebody in the comment, do you know who Bernie Burns is? I do not. Okay. I didn't even try to look him so up. So there's yet. like a, yeah, there's like a, a, a podcast. I him up, but I didn't. I'm so out of it, okay? <laughs> you know, like like people like, because uh, I, I mentioned this stuff on my Instagram and everyone's like, oh yeah, I totally know that thing, right? So it's like roasted duck or roasted teeth or something. I don't know. The name, the name of the podcast apparently is really popular. I never heard of it. Mm. But someone says that I sound exactly like the host Bernie Burns or one of the guys there. I went on the YouTubes. Yeah. Have you heard of this thing called YouTube? YouTuber. I uh, YouTuber. No, that's YouTuber. another. That's another site. <laughs> that's probably what where, where you always go to try to find my stuff, right? You're know, like, I can't find anything on the YouTuber. Uh, and and they said that I sound like this Bernie Burns guy, and I uh, listened to him. And I don't sound like that guy you don't at sound all. Like Bernie Burns. No, and I listened to about two minutes of the podcast. I'm like, who would listen to this crap, right? <laughs> Uh, it's much more sensible oh, to listen to, uh, you know, Kung Fu stuff on darn the Kung it, Fu Genius. Darn it. <laughs> it's time for a YouTuber. YouTube, that's YouTuber right there. What is there. the podcast about? I have no idea. I watched, I watched two minutes of it just to hear if this guy actually sounded like me. Mm -hmm. And if he held a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you what that podcast so was about. it's not about tubas. No, I don't know what it's about. So anyway, here we are with another Ask Me Anything episode. We did oh. the Alex Ben Block thing last week, but we didn't finish it. So we will finish it eventually. Right, maybe four more. Ten, ten episodes for now. No, there's only I think like there's only I think like four more minutes left or whatever. Oh, but we can definitely oh, stretch that out to an entire episode. Chunk. Yeah. Okay. And I want to see if I can actually get like the Alex Ben Block on the podcast. I can't promise anything. Um, he's he's I can get in contact with That'd him. That'd be so. dope. It would be dope, right? So let's maybe we'll. Hey, finish. Alex. Yeah. How yeah. you doing what's over your, here? What what what's your star sign? <laughs> The date of birth. Do you consider yourself an American? <laughs> he just keeps bombarding you with questions. That'd be great, right? Yeah, Straight yeah, interrogation, right? So here we are with another Ask Me Anything episode. So go ahead and uh, start asking. 
All right. So first off, uh, we got Flip Jakimowski. Oh no, Philip. My bad. My bad. Botched his name. I, Philip I, Jakimowski. I think Flip Jakimowski is pretty cool, actually. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I would hang out with that guy. Yeah. Snap. I don't know. It's starting to sound like it's another Dreisen type thing. Is the yeah, next question going to come from Phil McCracken? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Right? It's from Jack. Yeah. Or, or Tony Hawk's brother, Mike. Mike Hawk. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. These The questions are going to start coming Tony from these kind Hawk's of names. Brother yeah. Tony Mike. Hawk's brother, Mike. Michael Hunt as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, gotcha. All right. So, uh, Philip Jakimowski, do you think... <laughs> wow. Why are you shaking your head, though? Huh? Why are you shaking your head? Like no, I, did, I had a little bit of uh, oh, yeah, dribble? Co- coffee, so coffee on my dribble. beard. Yeah, yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> do you think Bruce Lee would be satisfied with today's MMA? Mama. Mama. The mama. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's a really good question. Um, I have no idea. I think, you know, obviously we can only speculate. Um, I'm sure he would actually like the fact that there is a type of fighting that addresses all the different things that can happen in combat. Punching, kicking, grappling, clinching, all of these things. I'm sure he would be very interested in watching it because you're. It's it's kind of like a live science experiment, right? You can go in there and see what works and what happens when you put, you know, the, the fighters of these different skill sets. Like you have a striker and a grappler and how they kind of learn to to counter each other. So I'm sure he would like it. I'm sure you would probably still have some issues with, you know, some of the rules. Well, I mean. Obviously, you have to have some rules in order for it to be a, a, a real sport. I mean, you cannot allow eye gouging, and that will not be like a real sport if you allowed that. Um, but, you know, th- there are certain things like in, in mixed martial arts, like you can't do a 12 to 6 elbow and stuff like this. There's still some strange rules that are in there, but I think for the most part, I think you would have liked it, especially when you juxtapose that to the style of fighting that was prevalent in martial arts back then, which was point karate, which again is like the recurring point when we talk about the Yukon Bruce wasn't competing. Mm. First of all, the only real competitive fight sports out there were either boxing or point karate, right? And everyone's like, yeah, what about full contact? Full contact karate and full contact kickboxing came a little bit later, right? And uh, this is not something that was prevalent in the 60s. Besides, you know, Bruce was already teaching martial arts and like to think that like while he's starting to get into these bigger projects, he's going to suddenly go, you know what? Why don't I I'm, I'm going to hold off on that movie script. I'm going to go into a training camp to go do kickboxing now, because in 2021, there are going to be people commenting as to why I didn't do kickboxing. So I'm going to put this movie stuff on hold and I'm going to go into this hypothetical tournament and go into a, uh, a training camp because, you know, the bros on YouTube are going to say I never had a real legit fight. Right. So, I mean, the problem is like the amount of hindsight bias and like speculative thinking that gets put on to like why Bruce did this or didn't do that. I mean, look, point karate, I'm sorry, is kind of a joke. It's basically a game of tag. And yeah. that's what Chuck Norris was a champion in, right? The other one was boxing, right? And Bruce was not a boxer, although Bruce had boxed and fought Gary Elm successfully in Hong Kong. So he actually did have a legit sport match in his life. He had a, 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 a match with a boxer and won. But I think he would have liked MMA. Um, Maybe even more the current iteration rather than the early kind of style versus style, like mm. who really wants to see some fat guy fight a sumo guy, right? You know, I mean, like the early days, right? I think now it's a lot more interesting because the the athletes are just so much better and, and these styles make fights and you really can see some really high level stuff going on there. So, yeah, I think I think uh, I think you'd like I'm it. Picturing the 80 uh, year old Bruce Lee sitting down on a couch. Yeah. Watching some MMA. Who do you think his favorite bo- uh, fighter would be? Well, I'm sure he'd be an Anderson Silva fan, yeah, right? Yeah, um, I think so. But he would also m- probably appreciate GSP because GSP's got that kind of same kind of feeling, and, and, and GSP's also very fond of Bruce Lee as well. Uh-huh. Um, Conor McGregor and has a lot of very the uh, bravado. No, no, no. I think the fighting style because Conor McGregor is a southpaw, yeah. so he fights with the right lead because he's left-handed. But that's actually a very similar setup to what Bruce taught in Jeet Kune Do, just for right-handed people to keep the right hand in front. And there were certain aspects of some things that Conor McGregor did that were very JKD esque. So I, I'm sure, I'm sure he'd like that too. Hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. Good stuff, Philip. 
Jakimowski. All right, Felipe Godoy, or Godoy. Greetings. I wonder if you have any insights on the origins of the rivalry between Wing Chun and Choi Lei Fat. Mm. Also, what were the most notable clashes between these two styles? Thanks. Great podcast. Wow, thank you. So I'm not, uh, I'm not like particularly well versed on like the exact feuds and everything that went on between the two of them. I mean, you know, why would Choi Lei Fat and Wing Chun have a kind of rivalry? Well, if you look at the martial arts spectrum, let's just say the Chinese Kung Fu martial arts spectrum, Choi Lei Fat and Wing Chun represent essentially two opposite sides of the debate, right? Mm -hmm. It's the idea of being straight line and direct and fast over the very powerful curved and whipping lines of Choi Lei Fat. So essentially, Wing Chun is all about the straight line and Choi Lei Fat is all about these very aggressive and fast and powerful curved line attacks, right? It's not to say that Choi Lei Fat also doesn't have straight punches as well, obviously. But what is Choi Lei Fat known for? Well, in layman's terms, they're known for more kind of windmilling round and hooking punches, right? So it's basically the idea of, uh, is your straight line punch going to be able to knock me down and stop me before this thing that comes from Oklahoma <laughs> through Texas uh, <laughs> knocks your head clean off, right? And so obviously because it both styles essentially espouse the opposite art side of the argument. It's kind of the big power versus efficiency in fighting. They naturally are going to have a rivalry, right? So uh, interestingly enough, a good friend of mine who I discussed many times before, Sifu Chan Chi Man. Chan Chi Man was a very early period student of Yip Man, like very, very early days. And before he learned Wing Chun, he learned Choi Lei Fat. So he learned from his Sifu and he, you know, had started learning some that. forms. Yeah, he was a, basically a Choi Lei Fat guy, right? And so he was learning that style of Kung Fu. And then um, Chan Chi Man had a friend by the name of William Cheung, right? <laughs> and William Cheung did, uh, you know, obviously did Wing Chun. And I, the two of them get talking one day and then they decide well, let's go ahead and try it out, right? Which is kind of the way that a lot of these things started. When people think about the old challenge fights back in the days, they weren't always these kind of archetypical school versus school challenges. Sometimes it was just two kids that went to high school. Uh, oh, you're doing Charlie Lei Fat, I do Wing Chun. Uh, yeah, you want to like after after school, we, we, can, we can play around a little bit, see what's what, right? So they, the spectrum was like, it went from like, we're friends, we just do two different styles, we're going to kind of, you know, slap the shit out of each other after school for fun, and then hug it out, and next day, we both have black eyes, but we're cool, yeah. right? Um, and then, of course, you have like a formal challenge, right? And the problem is that when people talk about this like golden period of Wing Chun fighting the other styles, like in the 50s and maybe early 60s, a lot of these stories where it's just like two buddies kind of trying it out, get kind of thrown into these other stories of, let's say, more serious or more dangerous challenge fights, right? So when Chan Chi Man first decided to kind of have a go at his friend William Cheung, they um, they first did it with some friends around, right? And I know this because he literally told me the story. <laughs> uh, I have it on I have it on video, right? And so their friends were around, and he said, you know, I guess one of the typical things that would happen in those days is like before we would fight. This is very kind of old school. Uh, you're a, let's say you're a Choi Lei Fat guy, right? Mm -hmm. So before we fight, you would like bust out a couple Choi Lei Fat moves, right? Mm. Pop, 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 right? And then I'd bust out a couple Wing Chun moves and then we would go, almost like a, almost like a precursor to video games, right? Okay. You come out and you do your signature moves, <laughs> okay, now we're gonna fight, right? And so I guess Chen Ji Men comes out and they're discussing the different styles and maybe he busts out some Choi Lei Fat shapes and then uh, William Cheung does the Siu Nam Tao. Right, which is of course like you know, <laughs> if you ever this, the the Siunam Tao is basically a, a a sleeping pill in 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 the shape of a form, right? Right, right. And so the you know the joke was that while William Cheung was doing the Tan Tao from the Siunam Tao, uh, that Chan Chi Man went up to him and just put a coin in his hand because it looked like he's begging for money, right? It was kind of a joke. <laughs> so Chan Chi Man is kind of clowning him because of course you can imagine. God. If you have never seen, and remember in the 1950s, what people forget is that Wing Chun was an unknown style in Hong Kong. 
uh, at the time that Yip Man started teaching. It wasn't like Yip Man came and Wing Chun already had an established reputation in Hong Kong okay. and he was just the new guy teaching it. He was the first guy teaching it, okay? And, and yes, there may have been some people from the Yun Kei San lineage who might have already been in Hong Kong. Obviously, you have the Siula Wang Chun guys, the Eternal Spring, but that's a kind of a different style, related but still different enough. So really... Yip Man was the first one to bring this style Wing Chun to Hong Kong. And no one knew what it was. And obviously Wing Chun, the, the, the forms are very abstract. Where Wing Chun really excels and where Wing Chun focuses on is in the partner practice, not so much in the forms. But many of the other Kung Fu styles have far better looking forms and way more forms. And, and so you have to imagine if you, you see something like Choi Lei Fat or Hong Kun, and in the 1950s that is your... Are, that is your stereotype in your head for what Chinese Kung Fu forms look like. And then you see someone kind of bend their knees and go into this pigeon-toed stance and do these small movements with their hands. It's like, what is this? What is this? Mm. Right? So, he, you know, he puts the, the coin in his, in his hand like, like he's begging, you know, for money or whatever, kind of clowning. <laughs> so him, right? disrespectful. Super disrespectful, right? And then they, um, they kind of have like, then they decide to have a go, right? And so, um, you know, Chan Chi Man says, you know, he's moving around a lot and, you know, doing his Choi Le Fat shapes. And he says at first he was actually able to get a couple little licks in on uh, William Cheung, but William Cheung wasn't, wasn't really taking it seriously yet, right? And then so so he gets a couple, you know, a couple shots in and then William Cheung decides like, okay, now it's time to hit the gas. And it goes and basically runs him over with chain punches. And, and um, they were on a rooftop. Mm. And he almost like pushed Chen Chi Man towards the ledge, right? And and so I believe that maybe they had one or two exchanges, and it was pretty clear you know, William Chang was kind of the victor, and Chen Chi Man was still not entirely convinced. Uh, um, you know, it's kind of like it's always that. Well, it's always like maybe he was, just, he was just lucky. He was just yeah. lucky, <laughs> like when a like when a boxer loses a match, it's like oh, I want an immediate rematch. It's like. Right. They, they, because they just see like well, he just got a lucky shot in and that was it right so um my foot broke yeah my foot broke right <laughs> so so they decided uh afterwards uh he said why don't we have another match but this time in private where they're not like other people watching right so then a few days later a week later whatever it was uh they have a second match and pretty much the same result so, and that was then the time when um, Chen Chi Man decided, okay, I'm, I want to learn Wing Chun. And then William Chang brought Chen Chi Man to, uh, to Yip Man, and that's how the whole thing started. So Chen Chi Man was originally a Charlie Fudd guy, right? So um, this, you know, it wasn't because of a big rivalry. It's just the other thing that I think people don't realize is while there are certainly a lot of different Kung Fu schools, all right? They're different styles. Um, when you're talking about the the ecosystem of Hong Kong Chinese martial arts in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Yes, you had Zhao Ga Tong Long, you know, the, the Southern Mantis. You had some of the, the Chat Sing Tong Long, the, the Northern Mantis. Uh, you, had a f you had a number of different styles that you could learn in Hong Kong in the 50s. But in terms of the really prominent ones, um, it was really Char Le Fat and Hong Kun. Those are like the real prominent styles that even though the uh, other styles like Southern Mantis are, are very good styles and had established schools, um, other styles, they, they just weren't as popular. So there tends to be an idea of like when we get a question like this, that um, you think of it as there being an equal dispersion of various Kung Fu styles in Hong Kong in the 50s. So, you know, why did, why did Wing Chun people end up fighting Choi Le Fat people all the time? Mm. Because there weren't a lot of other schools of Kung Fu that would also cha like have challenge fights. It, it wasn't like there were 50 schools of Kung Fu and Wing Chun was only getting into it with Choi Le Fat, right? <laughs> it, it, it just happened right, that right. The, the Choi Le Fat guys also seemed to be, there were certain schools that seemed to be pretty scrappy and pretty down to fight. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of the other Kung Fu styles were not as down to fight or maybe they were much smaller or didn't have a lot of students or whatever, right? So uh, I'm more of the opinion that the reason why a lot of Choi Le Fat and Wing Chun people fought each other, besides them being on the opposite ends of the argument, is because statistics. 
that I don't think there were nearly as many different types of schools that were down to fight at any moment as people think they were. Okay. All right. So uh, that's part of it, too. Obviously, I told in the challenge fight episode. And so if um, uh, I, I forget the name of the person who asked the question, if he wants to hear a, a, a Choi Le Fat story, um, you can Philippe. Yeah, Philippe, you can go back to the um, challenge fight stories episode or school fight stories. And I tell the story about uh, Lang Ting's brother, Lang Toon, getting yeah. in into it with the Charlie Fett guy after they had the ring, uh, the fight in the ring. And then the Charlie Fett school came, uh, you know, like the next day to the Lang Ting gym. And there was that whole thing. Right. So I don't want to like just tell that story again because I, I've, I've done that already. So you can listen to it there. Um, some northern styles of Kung Fu si Choi Lei Fat is, uh, is an amalgam of three different styles, a Choi, the Li, and a Fat, a Buddha hand style, mm. which is part of the reason why it has so many different forms. And although it's a southern style, um, it, it bears a lot of, it, it, you know, it's considered a southern style because of where it kind of was developed. But a lot of the forms in Choi Lei Fat actually bear the stamps of northern styles. Which is why it, it you know, wow. the kind of longer range, wider movements, right? So um, there are, there's a lot of speculation that some northern styles, mm, I'm not the one making the speculation, I'm just telling you what I heard. So if Charlie Fudd people out there want to, like, don't take issue with me, I'm not telling you, this is just what I heard. I don't have any skin in the game. I'm a Wing Chun idiot, okay? Um, that um, Charlie Fudd and Pekwa are actually related, Pekwa being this kind of. Typical long range axe fist style that was later combined with monkey kung fu in Dai Seng Pekwa. So you can see when you look at Pekwa and you look at Choi Lei Fat, you can see a lot of similarities. And Pekwa is a northern style. So, I mean, it could be confirmation bias, it's very difficult to say. Obviously, if there's someone out there who really knows, I would love to hear from them. Um, but certain styles of northern kung fu and certain styles of what's called northern Shaolin actually have a lot of elements that you would also find in Choi Lei Fat. And even in Hong Kong, there seemed to be a bit of uh, confusion. Um, so for example, Bruce in his daytimer in 1959, I think, the year that he went to the States, he had a fight in Kowloon City, which is where the airport used to be, mm. um, between him and it was always reported that it was a Choi Lei Fat guy that he fought. And the Choi Lei Fat guy was able to land on Bruce and he gave Bruce a black eye. And, mm. and he actually gave Bruce a very tough fight. And Bruce came back and ended up knocking out uh, the guy's tooth or a number of teeth. And uh, interestingly enough, there's a new documentary on the History Channel uh, called History's Mysteries. It's episodic. And episode three of season two is on the death of Bruce Lee. And it just came out a few days ago at the time of this recording. And Chan Chi Man, who I just mentioned, he's in the he's episode. In okay. And uh, I actually helped to arrange that interview for the History Channel for that episode. Um, they didn't give me a thank you, though, at the end of the episode. So, okay. So anyway, um, but yeah, I, I helped to get Chan Chi Man there. He was a great, like, they have him in two Damn. scenes where he talks about Bruce Lee and talks about Yeet Man. And um, uh, in it, Bruce's brother, Robert, talks about that fight that Bruce had where he got hit and he got a black what? eye and then, but he ended up knocking out the guy's tooth. So it, that seemed to be the fight that kind of broke the camel's back because potentially uh, that guy that he beat up was, his father was a detective or he had gotten in trouble for that fight and Bruce was already in trouble with the cops for having so many fights. So that Choi Lei, well, that, where, I should say, that supposed Choi Lei Fut fight was actually the one that it was the reason why Bruce's father was like, all right, you need to go to the States mm. um, because mm. Bruce had an American, he was an American citizen because he was born in the States. But apparently at that time he had to go by the time he was 18, otherwise he would have lost his American citizenship. So, but it also ended up being perfect because it was like he was getting in trouble in Hong Kong. So apparently that fight where Bruce got the black eye because he, 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 had, he would get into fights and often not tell his parents. But because he got a black eye in this fight, it was kind of unavoidable. Like it was obvious something had happened. And uh, that was the reason supposedly why he went to the States. Now, everyone talks about that was a Choi Lei Fut fight. And um, in Bruce's day timer, he says that the guy that he fought was a student of Long Chi Chun. Now, Long Chi Chun, 
I know his son, Long Kaimeng. I've met him before. Long Kaimeng, his son, was one of the founders of the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association in 1968. Wow. He's one of the OGs of like the establishment of Chinese martial arts. And I've sat and I've talked to him. And he's a great dude. He's super funny. Um, and I remember when I first met him, he, uh, I have a photo of me with him and my wife and Maria. She was really small. And he said, uh, oh, my Si Hing got in a fight with Bruce Lee. And I remember hearing that. And the problem with Bruce Lee fight stories is you're always dismissive of them. If you're a real Bruce Lee fan, see, if you don't know yeah. much about Bruce Lee, you believe every shit anyone tells you. Oh, you know, Bruce Lee, you know, fought uh, Muhammad Ali once, right? <laughs> uh, and you're like, oh, really? Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I saw that, right? Do you, you know Bruce Lee? He uh, played ping pong with nunchucks, right? You saw that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that, right? <laughs> yeah, I saw and then, that. But you get real deep into Bruce Lee. And the opposite thing happens. You almost just literally don't believe anyone, anything, anything anyone tells you because you've Any heard letters. so much BS. You know, I mean, the latest thing, who is Bruce Lee? He's the playwright David Henry Huang, in dis yeah. you know, who's been in disguise for years. Right? <laughs> literally, someone tried to convince me of this. Like, this is mind-numbing nonsense, okay? Um, and, and so... You you, right. you start to discredit it after a while because it's like, yeah, 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 everyone has fought Bruce Lee. You know, like people say stuff like, oh, Gene LaBelle was Bruce Lee's grappling instructor, right? Bruce Lee had very meticulous day timers, his daily diary. Mm -hmm. And you can see the entries, like literally every single inconsequential appointment Bruce would ever have. He would go shopping. He went to the doctor. Chuck Norris was going to come at one o'clock and they were going to do cheese out. He would even write what they did. Bruce had absolutely meticulous day timers, mm. right? On everything he did, who trained with him. And John Little, a friend of the podcast, who was biographer for the Lee Estate for a long time, had access to all of these day timers and has made copies of all these things. He can literally reference these things. So John Little is probably one of the few t guys who you could say, how many times did Chuck Norris train with Bruce Lee? And he could literally go back yeah. and thumb through and give you an actual number, wow. okay? And so, but everyone's like, oh, you know that Gene LaBelle was Bruce Lee's grappling instructor. There's not a single entry of Bruce training or meeting Gene LaBelle. Uh. So, like, th there's all these kind of things. Like, he met Gene LaBelle on the set of a TV show that they had done together, right? Mm -hmm. But in the lore now, like, oh, and then, you know, Gene LaBelle picked him up and, oh, don't let me down. And then, oh, and then he was training him in grappling and he came over and all this kind of stuff. And then there's actually no evidence of that, all right? And Bruce never mentioned Gene LaBelle as an influence, right? So... You, you know, you you kind of go back and you wonder, like, you have to be very careful because people people like Gene LaBelle, they accept it, right? But then people say, so people just accept, oh, he was his grappling instructor, right? And um, you you realize after a while, like, some Lung Kai Ming tells you, oh, my, my Si Hing fought with Bruce Lee. It's like, oh, all right, cool story. <laughs> Turns out it was true. Okay. Because Lung Kai Ming's father is Long, was Long Chi Chun. And Bruce, in his daytimer, wrote that he fought a student of Long Chi Chun. And I didn't find that so later. And I'm like, and the reason why it stuck out to me is because Long. Long is dragon in Chinese. Mm. And it's very rare that someone has the name dragon as a surname. Because, you know, in Chinese, the surname comes first. Wow. So that guy's, that, that Sivu and Long Kai Meng, his surname is literally dragon. And that's... <laughs> That's very rare even in Chinese. So like when you see someone has the name, it's L-U-N-G, Long. You go like, wow, that's, dude's name is Dragon. Yeah. Right? That's not like the most common name, right? And so. That's hardcore. And so supposedly this this big crazy fight Bruce had with a Choi Le Fat guy. And I've even on the in the past on the podcast said, yeah, he was a Choi Le Fat guy. He was a student of Long Chi Chun. Forgetting that Long Chi Chun is actually a master of northern Shaolin martial arts. Not necessarily of Choi Le Fat. But whether it was Bruce didn't didn't realize like didn't know the difference. Be, like he know this guy was a student of Long Chi Chun, but may have thought the guy was a Choi Le Fat guy. He may not have known because why does everyone think that he's a Choi Le Fat guy? Probably Bruce told him that Bruce may have not known the difference, or there m might have been some connection there, right? So um, so anyway, kind of long story mm. short, it was statistics. These were the guys that were around at that time. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. How many kung fu? styles are out there i don't know and if i give you a number i'll get uh, 90 comments telling me that it's wrong and it's yeah. twice the amount or half the amount ha oh, so i'm not even <laughs> because the problem is like okay is wing chun one style 
All wow. right. When you look at all That's the different deep. Wing Chun, right? Because you, you, you say that and people are going to go, well, well, actually, the, you know, the, the Leung Chan <laughs> Gulo village Wing Chun is different from the Yip Man Wing Chun, which is different from the Siu Lam Wing Chun, right? So you have a lot of styles that are related to each other. But at what point do you then say that it's a different style or it's the same style? So if, if you say Wing Chun is one style, all right, and then you really just want to like do it in that kind of way, okay, then obviously there are going to be fewer styles. But the problem is there's so many village forms of Kung Fu that were in small villages that were not really popular. Um, you have basic groupings, mm -hmm. northern and southern, right? You know, and... Uh, internal and external but for me these are all just kind of false dichotomies this is all just kind of marketing so how many i don't know i couldn't yeah. tell you it's like techno you know you got techno and then you got tons of subgenres. right right but like but no one techno. actually listens to techno so unless they're german <laughs> all right <laughs> all right next up we got john barton all right hello kung fu genius greetings from hong kong love your show please keep up the good work I have a question. You mentioned on a previous episode to have seen the early Tang Sang film footage of Grandmaster Yip Man now held by Sifu Kernspeck. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what are the key differences compared to the film footage from 1972? All right. Well, first of all, I want to say the Sifu Kenshpe has the footage, but uh, Sifu Langting also has a copy. And I saw it through Sifu Langting, not through Sifu Kenshpe. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty different. Um, first of all, uh, the history of the, uh, the, the footage that was shot shortly before Yip Man passed away, the one that you can see on YouTube, uh, that was shot, from my understanding, you know, within 10 days of... Yip Man passing. And Yip Man was dying of throat cancer. At that point in the video, he doesn't have any teeth. When you see still shots from there, you can actually see that his chin is kind of sunken back because he has no teeth in his mouth anymore, right? Mm. And he was very sick. And then uh, I, I suppose in some kind of effort for his sons to have some kind of record or authentic record, they decided to film these, this video of him doing Wing Chun, basically literally in his dying breath. But the idea was that this film wasn't going to be released to the public. It was essentially just for the, the Yip brothers, right, to keep for themselves, right? And then in the late 70s and early 80s, um, William Chang was making some claims about the nature of Yip Man's Wing Chun, about there being a traditional Wing Chun style, which was superior and which was supposedly from Leung Bik, and uh, contained forms with different choreography and slightly different concepts and different footwork and a bunch of other stuff, right? And and going pretty hard and on this and basically creating this dichotomy of what's called traditional and modified Wing Chun, which is a dichotomy that was created by William Chang. And nowhere nowhere outside of the William Chang universe to do these is Wing Chun categorized as traditional or modified, right? And it, it has become so prevalent that sometimes you know, we'll get an email like, oh, do you guys teach traditional or modified Wing Chun? And the, this is, these terms are essentially a non-starter. This is something that only exists in the William Chang narrative. And this isn't something that's actually accepted outside of that, right? So um, in the 70s and particularly in the early 80s, William Chang was making a lot of claims about the nature of Wing Chun because it wasn't just a claim about hi him having re-engineered his own Wing Chun and thinking it's better, he's making a claim that affects all Wing Chun people outside of his lineage, which is that Yip Man taught a fraudulent style of Wing Chun for 22 years and only taught the real one to one teenager, right? Which, as you can imagine, inflamed the entire Wing Chun world, right? <laughs> and so what they decided to do was in 1984... At that time, there was a lot of back and forth between the Wing Chun Athletic Association writing letters and William Chang and so on and so forth. And they decided to release the video footage of Yip Man performing the, the, those forms because no one, because William Chang certainly didn't know that they exist, right? And there's a, there's a saying in, in Chinese that a dying man tells no lies, okay? And so Leung Tang in 1984 released a video called Authentic Wing Chun, which he kind of, it's like, a, it's like a one hour overview of the Wing Chun system. They show the Siunam Tao, the Chum Kyu, the Biu Ji, some of the wooden dummy techniques, and Qi Sao and demonstrations, so on and so forth. And 
through Yip Chun, they decided to release portions of the Yip Man footage from 1972, shortly before he passed. Mm. Which would so it would be either most likely the last week of November in 1972 when that was shot, and they decided to release it because it would be the first time it would ever be released to kind of show like, hey, there are people out there claiming that. Yip Man's real Wing Chun is so on such and such, right? But here, for the first time, we're actually going to show you what his f- form looked like. So they showed some outtakes from the Siunam Tao form and from the wooden dummy techniques. They didn't show the whole thing all the way through. Mm. And and the reason, Siva Leung Ting told me, the reason why he didn't show the wooden dummy all the way through um, is because Yip Man's performance, he's literally dying. So if... If you watch the uncut performance, mm. uh, Yip Man has to take a number of breaks. There are times where he kind of like will pause in front of the dummy, like because uh, especially when he gets to the last sets, because he didn't teach the last sets as often. Plus, he's literally also dying, so he like kind of pauses. And there are times where like halfway through, he has to put his arms on the dummy and kind of take a break. So, uh, mm. Siva Leung Ting at that time he didn't want people to see Yip Man like that. So that's part of the reason why he just showed little clips of it because he didn't want to show people like Yip Man getting tired or Yip Man like kind of slumping over on the dummy or something like that, right? So he released a slightly edited form of it for that reason. But then years later, the Yip brothers eventually just released the thing in its entirety and you can see it all over YouTube, right? So, um, but Leung Teng did not want to release it in its entirety because... He told me, you can see Yip Man is really struggling and he doesn't want people to, to see him like that, right? And, you know, by the, he, he did a pretty good performance of the Siu Nam Tao, but by the time he does the Chum Q, you can see his, his powers wavering already by the second form. And, and so um, he, he kind of pulls it together for the wooden dummy, but he's, he's forgetting some parts and he mixes up some stuff in the last um, eighth, in the eighth set in particular. And oddly enough, doesn't show the eighth kick all right Mm -hmm. and so there were some things about that performance that were like very curious right and then you go back five years to 1967 and his student Tang Sang uh, filmed Yip Man doing the Siu Nam Tao Cham Kyu uh, wooden dummy and long pole in the Sam Soi Bo detectives club and so Yip Man was five years younger all right You, you know he wasn't young and spry but he was definitely still fit and so the performance is clean. Like mm. he performs the stuff all the way through. He does the pole. He does the dummy. So you don't see him. One of the big differences is you don't see him taking these like yawning breaks in between when he does it, right? And the wooden dummy form is very straight all the way through. You can see he's not struggling to remember what the eighth set is. He just does it, right? So um, it's a it's a much better performance. Man. Yeah. Man, I would love to see that. All right. Good question. Let's move forward. Moving right along to Tan Tan Der. Hi, Sifu Alex. Is there any secret technique like pressure points in the Wing Chun system? Or is it just crap? (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Well, we actually, I think we addressed this, um, not on the last episode, but I think on the previous MMA where we talked about, uh, did I just say MMA? I think you might have. Jesus Christ. You might have said MMA. MMA. You know what's funny? Hey, MMA. If people note that I'm a little off, this is the first time we're actually recording an episode so early. True. We're not, wow. we're not look at look Mike D, he's like a slick at his face, man. He looks like a freaking <laughs> raccoon. <laughs> I haven't slept in two days. <laughs> and so, you know, normally normally we record we record these like in the middle of the day. We've yeah. already had breakfast, lunch. And we had coffee. Yeah, and we've yeah. had our coffee we, ready to we go. Had like, coffee ready, this right. is like this is almost like a job. Got here in the morning punching a clock, like here we are early, You're right? The only one I, literally, coffee. I literally called it an MMA, all right? <laughs> So there we go. All right. So um, I actually talked extensively about pressure points and and why I think that stuff is BS because, you know, people would be dropping dead from massages and bumping into stuff all the time if that stuff was real. Right. Remember, we talked about that. Right. So um, I I don't want to sound too redundant. I mean, some people, you, you know, you push them in certain points and they feel sensitive and other people don't. Right. And I think um, if someone the, the problem is this. All right. 
and and you know you always have to look at things in a very scientific or or sometimes scientistic kind of way. I like looking things at a scientistic kind of way uh, myself. Okay, let's pretend. Mm. Okay, so so here's the thing: if you you want to go through the thought experiment, right? In my opinion and estimation, it, it, it's not real. Okay, it's not reliable, and it doesn't work because if it was real. The, you know, the U.S. military would be studying it and teaching it. Mm. Spies would be learning it. It would be a big deal. Uh, if it's real, someone spies. is going to... Mo- Look, here's the thing about... If something is real, I love it's going to get monetized. Yeah. All right? If it's not real, then not. Okay? Uh, also, my other thing... And again, I'm just to, to highlight a couple points. Like, if there were these points on you that could be pressed that will disable or cripple you or whatever, like, people would be dropping like flies from massages. Okay, just got hit in the wrong point, uh, you know, all of a sudden, whatever, boom. right? And then I know someone goes, yeah, well, somebody gave me a massage, went too hard, and then my neck couldn't move <laughs> or whatever. Okay, so that was the death touch. Yeah. That was the dimak, right? Yeah. Okay, so I don't think it's real for those reasons, right? But let's pretend it's real, okay? Let's pretend that there's a set grouping of points on your body that if I get one of them with the right amount of pressure at the right time or whatever, I can stop you from attacking me. Or maybe I need to get one or two of them in a quick sequence in order for this death touch thing to work. Let's pretend that works. All right. Okay, let's, let's pretend. pretend that such a thing exists, okay? Now you're faced with someone who is who outweighs you by 60 pounds. He's standing in front of you, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs, all right? Because these are how fights start. They don't start in a ring. <laughs> they don't start with you starting in push hands or chi sao the dude's no. standing there and he's screaming at you all right and he's telling you blah, blah, what the f you looking at blah, 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 like this right and you are armed with this secret knowledge that if you just jab your left thumb into you know the right side of his neck and then you take your your you know right middle finger knuckle and jab it right into his solar plexus within two seconds of each other this guy is going to be temporarily immobilized and not yeah, going to be able to like do anything he got stun right? gunned okay yeah exactly right <laughs> Okay, now the dude charges at you. Now go ahead, do it. Do it. Go ahead and do it. Okay, <laughs> you, you you see what I mean? So the problem is that one, no I don't, pressure. One, I don't believe that it works. And two, the problem is even if it did work, I'd be very hard pressed how you would be able. I, the only people who would be able to apply dimak would be grapplers, mm. because you'd get someone on the ground, you'd put them in like a triangle choke and immobilize them. They can't move. And now you can hit them in that sweet secret point. Yeah. All right. But if the dude's running around trying to, you know, throw windmill punches at you, yeah, go ahead. Put your <laughs> thumb right there in that point of his neck and then stick that thing right there in the solar plexus and then show me how that thing works. Even if it was real, I don't think it would work. So there you go. So there's no secret techniques in the Wing Chun system. There's all sorts of secret stuff. All right. And um, I'm sure the Sifu's out there who teach the mock and teach all that stuff, but that doesn't mean. A very famous story. Two of Yip Man's students broke into Yip Man's bedroom while he was uh, away, right? <laughs> and um, and this is in the 50s. I'm not going to say who it is, it is all right? <laughs> because, because Yip Man was, you know, teaching, oh, so, so sometimes taught in his home, right? Yeah. He sometimes also taught from home, right? Yeah. So he had gone out or something, or he was in the bathroom. I don't know what the story was, right? And they decided, like, they were going to, like, look in his room to see if they could find something, right? Underneath Yip Man's bed, they found a book, which was like the Dimak, all the secret points on there, whatever, oh, right? Shit. And they were like, what? And then they like wrote a bunch of stuff down out of that book, like, oh, this is all the secret stuff or whatever. And it turns out Yip Man had received this book as a gift and didn't <laughs> place it of any value and just toss the thing under his bed, right? Meanwhile, those guys were like, oh, no, I can tell you about the real Wing Chun Dimak yeah. that they got from a book, from a five-cent pulp novel that was sitting under. Look, you could go into my office at my house right now yeah, and look at, they're all, I got all sorts of wacky books on my, you know, because I have like all the Wing Chun books, I got grappling books and martial art books and ninja books and stuff like that. I also have Dimak death touch books. Yeah, yeah. I have all that stuff, yeah, okay? Yeah. And if you didn't know anything about me, you'd be like, oh, this is the secret of the Kung Fu genius, right? <laughs> I even right. have the freaking Count Dante book. Oh. That guy, Count Dante with the Cata Dante, the, the Dance of Death. Total bullshit. I yeah. have his book. <laughs> I have his book. I've read it. Uh, I've literally read it. I have a sheet right, right. of Kim's books. Okay, I a read sheet every, of Kim. I literally read everything. You got to get a hey, sheet hey, of Kim. Hey, 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 do not be bad mouthing a sheet of Kim. I will not have it. He's going to be on the show eventually. I'd love to have him on the show. I'd love to have him on the show. It'd be fascinating. It'd be so amazing. It'd be amazing to have a sheet of Kim. A sheet of Kim, if you're out there, yeah. 
Come on, the Kung Fu Genius. Yeah. Please. All right. Next question. Sure. Ready? Oh, did you finish the story? I did. About the book under the I bed? Did. I'll tell you what, I finished what I'm going to say publicly on the podcast about that story, all right? <laughs> I know where you're going. I'm not telling the second half of that story. Get out of here. This thing Go goes on, on the YouTube. Get it's out of here. It's good. It's good. It's a good story. All right. All right. Next up, we got Raid Marinkovich. All right. I think it's Rade, like Sade. And Rade. I think, we, I think we've done this before. <laughs> no, we yeah, had the same we name have, before. Yeah. Rade. No, no, it, it's the same guy. All right. Yeah, you got the same question, though. No, you got a memory like a goldfish. I know. Every eight seconds, it I renews. I like that shit, though. Where am I? I'm all good with that. Yeah. It's yeah like you a are. a new life every you time are. I turn yeah. around. It's like, frustrating as hell for everyone who's <laughs> around you, but whatever. Yeah, <laughs> <absolutely>. <laughs> All right, let's do it. What'd you say? <laughs> No, you're like the budget character from that, that Christopher Nolan uh, film, Memento. Memento. The budget Memento. Yeah, you're mm. like the lifetime version of... What's uh, this, Guy Pierce? Guy Pierce. Yeah. Like, yeah, the lifetime Dre version Pierce. of Guy Pierce. Dre Pierce. Yeah. Yo, Dre. <laughs> What's the question? From from Raid. All right. I like that name, though. Raid. Yeah, you would. Rade. What is your thinking about Tan Tan Liang as a fighter? Tan Tao Liang. Tan Tan Liang. Yes. Uh, Dorian Tan, as he's also known as. Um, I'm a veritable cornucopia of useless information. (laughs) (laughs) Cornucopia. (laughs) Is that what your wife tells you? No, she tells me I'm a trash bag of useless information. (laughs) She uses a very different metaphor for that. Um, Okay. Tan Tao Lang is a, he's from Taiwan, I believe. Mm -hmm. And is a Taekwondo practitioner. And, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that like a lot of the really great leg kickers in Hong Kong cinema had um, had done some Taekwondo because Taekwondo really has some of the best kicks. I mean, Kung Fu has great kicks and spin kicks and jump kicks and everything like that. Mm. But the Taekwondo kickers are just so precise and so good. And some of the best kickers um, either had a Taekwondo background or they were Korean. So look at Drunken Master, the villain from Drunken Master, Huang Jiang Lei. Mm. Huang Jiang Lei is Korean. Taekwondo master from Korea also was an instructor during the Vietnam War for the military. Okay. And his kicks are amazing. I mean, when you see him fighting Jackie Chan in both Snake and Eagle Shadow and a Drunken Master, I mean, his, you know, his boot work, as they say, is incredible. I mean, his ability, his ability to kick is unbelievable, right? And then another Korean actor who made it big in Hong Kong at that time was uh, a guy who went by the name of Casanova Wong. All right. And uh, that's the firest name. It's the firest name, right? What? I think the Chinese name was just Kasafa, uh, <laughs> but but it was Casanova Wong. Casanova it's like good looking Wong. dude, but he was Korean. Now yeah. it didn't really matter at that time because most Chinese films at that time were dubbed anyway. So it actually didn't even ma- matter that the actor didn't even speak Chinese. Yeah. They would just mouth their lines, and they were dubbed anyway after the fact. So Huang Zhang Lei didn't speak Chinese in those movies. He's just dubbed, right? So Casanova Wong is in Warriors 2. He plays Chan Ma Shun, the student of Liang Chan. He's mm-hmm. Korean, but you look at his kicks, they're amazing. If you look at the uh, uh, other films that he was in, it's absolutely fascinating. And Dorian Tan was also, uh, he was not Korean, but he was a practitioner of Taekwondo. Now, I heard a story that Dorian Tan or Tan Tao Lang challenged Bruce Lee uh, very early on, but Tan Tao Lang at that time was very young and no one knew who he was. And so Bruce didn't even pay any attention to him. I heard that story. But I also heard, heard this story from someone who thinks he's the reincarnation of Bruce Lee. So I don't know how accurate that story is. <laughs> who okay? is this? I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> who is this I'm not person? telling you anything, okay? He so thinks... The, dude, maybe oh, I shouldn't I say that. I Forget about it. Forget I about I it. Pretend I didn't say that. <laughs> I think I know you know what? Know. Pretend I didn't say that. All right. I shouldn't oh. have said that. All right. Yeah, I know. Exactly. So anyway, I so that. anyway, the problem is like you hear stuff like this again, just like I said before, like, oh, yeah, uh, um, you, you know, Bruce Lee, uh, he fought Muhammad Ali. Really, really. And people tell you all sorts of Bruce Lee facts. And you're like, all right, all right, all right. My seeing fought Bruce Lee. All right. Well, it turns out that guy was actually right. Right. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, Tan Chao Lang actually challenged Bruce Lee. But, you know, he was like a nobody at that time. So Bruce didn't even pay any attention. OK. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. It doesn't really matter. All right. He was a very, very good kicker. And uh, you can see videos, obviously clips of his films, but also his demonstrations. I mean, just legit. The guy was awesome. All right. Next up, we we got uh, Dreisen. And uh, 
His question is, uh, hypothetically speaking. His question. Yes. Hypothetically speaking. One day you rent out your school, City Wing Chun. All right. Oh, is that the name of my school? Yeah. Thanks for that important piece of information. Of course. Of course. Yeah. I mean, CityWT.com, peeps. Yes. And you rent your school, City Wing Chun, to a dance troupe. All right? It's a ballet slash hip hop slash cha cha dance troupe. They're working on an upcoming off Broadway show that you get invited to for their premiere coming up. Mm -hmm. The date of the premiere is oddly November 27th. You go to this premiere on November 27th because you're a good guy and you you like you get an invite and you say, "You know what? I'm going to I'm going to own up to this." What what's that? What's all that? Right? What's going on the over there? Questions are getting more and more convoluted. <laughs> The, pre, I, you the what? preamble to the questions is like, I spent a year here one afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you go to, to the premiere. You watch this spectacular show. You're now blown away. But you couldn't help notice that during the show, you feel your hair stand up on your neck. Why was the show spectacular, by the way? Uh, it, it's just amazing. Amazing cha-cha. All these different dance moves that can, Sifu can you loves. Can details? Sisu, Sifu loves these type of dances. Sisu loves these guys. <laughs> Sisu. Sisu. All right. So your hands, hair stand up, but you're just like, hmm, that's weird. All right. Really strange. <laughs> the show ends, ends and you get in, introduced to the owner, writer, dance choreographer. It's not David and when, Henry Wong, is it? And when he shakes your hand, you get a strange feeling. That is Bruce Lee uh -huh. disguised in a weird wig, fake beard. A weird wig. And <laughs> weird a fake wig beard. and a fake beard. Okay. What do you do? Wow. And your so, hair stand up again. Like my, my spidey sense your is hair, tingling. It's, you know it's him. Got you it. know because your hairs are just like I shake his hand. Spidey sense. He's a famous playwright. But he's just Bruce Lee in a weird wig and a fake beard. Okay, weird. and and it took you five minutes blonde, to send this story up. Wig. Weird he couldn't have just said like wig. he couldn't just say like imagine you go imagine you go to a play, <laughs> all right, and you meet the playwright afterwards and you swear it's Bruce Lee in a wig and beard. What would you do? No, we literally needed that entire setup. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and he right. still didn't tell me the details of the actual show. Right, you're very scant on those. <clears throat> a lot of cha cha, I know that. Mm. <laughs> and you feel it, you know it. Like the, 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 like you know, mm -hmm. it's him. Your hair is just standing. You, you, you just the handshake. The I feel it. The tone. He tries to disguise his uh -huh. voice a little. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Little, little. Uh, you know. My last name is Chong. My he's last name is Wong. John Wong. No, he tries to sound more uh -huh. like. My um, last name is Huang. <laughs> Henry. Henry. What do you do? David Henry Huang. What do you do? I say, oh. I look at him. <laughs> I shake his hands. You give him the Larry David? All right. Yeah, I'm giving him the look, right? Boop, 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 boop. Maybe I whisper in his ear. Siu Long Ko, Lei Zhai Gan Di Ma. What? <laughs> Which is uh, Little Dragon Brother. How have you been lately? <laughs> what? <laughs> and and he he his he, reaction would tell me everything. His reaction. All of these Dreisen questions that you write. Sorry, all of these Dreisen questions. Um, they always come down to me saying something to gauge someone's reaction, <laughs> and then that will tell me everything I need to know. Huh. Yeah, that's weird that he, Later, he does Gandhi, that. Ma. Yes, and yeah, but, how have you been lately? And, and <laughs> and why Betty Ting Pei? Yeah. <laughs> why? Yeah. So, why? so he uh, he doesn't he doesn't give you the response you want. This is you didn't even look at the hey, tablet I, when you when you said that. You are clearly says making it right this here. up. <laughs> says it right here, dude. Mikey he's, Dean. He's so making this up. Mikey Dean. Go it doesn't in, give huh? you the response. He doesn't give you the response that you want. Uh huh. What do you do then? 
Dude, you're just looking at OnlyFans. Don't even throw <laughs> <laughs> He's got what Jessica Alba OnlyFans on or something like that. <laughs> no, I, it's, it's a website, OnlyFans. Yeah. I got like this nice, cool silver fan, three speed. I got the, no, it's pretty, the, the square fan you here. You shouldn't invest in that company because in the winter they speed. won't make any money. I know. Um, <laughs> Okay. So he doesn't give you the response you want, but you 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 know it's him. Uh-huh. And he tries to walk away even. Uh-huh. What really? do you do? Kick him in the ass? You didn't even look down. You're totally making this question up. <laughs> what do you what do you do? Kick him in the ass? <laughs> That's, no, I'm just kidding. How come you're so intimately connected to the questions this person writes? Who? Dreyson. Wow, your memory is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that guy. Yeah. I don't know. He asks cool questions. Though. Maybe you I would just. Admit. Maybe I would just pose a quick JKD stance, right lead. Mm. Rub my nose. Try to get him to faint. Yeah. Try, try to, get to get him, him to react. Yeah. To, That's what I would oh, do. Yeah. Try that to sound? pull some reaction yeah. out of him. Does that satisfy you finally? Somewhat. Yeah. Right. Good. Yeah. yeah. Satisfies him Somewhat. though. Even though Dreisen asked the question, you're satisfied. <laughs> oh, wait, no, wait, I get no. it, though. Dreisen yeah, should be. No, I get it. I get be. it. Setting traps for Dreisen, you all day. just chime time. in, bro. Just I, chime in. Maybe, chime in, bro. Should, yeah, maybe we should get Dreisen on the uh, podcast. Or yeah. maybe we've already had him That's like right. 37 times. I have a feeling that Dreisen has a mirror above his bed so he can look at Dreisen. <laughs> <laughs> he actually has a whole mirrored bedroom. Wow. Oh, all right, next one. All right, next up, we got Tom Scott. Hello, Sifu Genius. I know you are young enough to have enjoyed Wing Chun on video, DVD, and YouTube. But I grew up with but a handful of books. My faves were James Yim Lee's book by O'Hara Pubs and Wing Chun Kun by Leung Ting. Do you have any old school faves? Yeah, well, I'm not that young. I mean, I'm definitely not the generation that grew up learning about Wing Chun through DVDs and YouTube. Um, let me tell you about my... I mean, I... You know, when, when I was getting into martial arts in the 80s, I mean, it was only books and magazines and things like that. Um, yeah, so the two books he mentions, the the famous Green Book uh, with James Yim Lee on the cover, which was actually written by Bruce Lee, but he gave the credit to his student, James Yim Lee, uh, so that he could earn a little bit of money to uh, pay for his cancer treatments at that time, right? Mm -hmm. So, And that's why he was the so-called technical advisor on that book. But really, if you read the that Green Wing Chun book, I mean, you, you can hear Bruce's voice while you're um, while you're reading it. That is a classic. Uh, I have that book as well. Obviously, Sifu Leung Ting's Wing Chun Kun book. I bought that in Hong Kong in 1996. Also another classic. Um, what other classics are there of Wing Chun? There, there was a, a, a series of three books called The Secret Techniques of Wing Chun, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And they were kind of more square shapes. It was K.T. Chow, I think, was the author. Hmm. And they were like written in a very 70s way. But they were pretty thorough for the time. And uh, I, I bought those at a uh, secondhand bookstore in Seattle known as Half Price Books. And I have all three of those. And they're very old. And, and not that many people know about it because I don't think KT Chow was a super high profile instructor. He claimed in the biography to be a student of Yip Man, but I, I don't know. Um, but the book, um, the, those books were actually pretty good. And I think I quoted one of the, I, in my. Chumkyu book, Seek the Bridge. Mm -hmm. I actually have a quote from KT Chow's book in there. So, oh, yeah, cool. yeah. So, the KT Chow series is pretty classic. I, uh, man, I mean, most of the good Wing Chun books are all old anyway. So, they can all be, I mean, obviously, they're new books that have come out, like my books, buy my book, citywt.com, uh, <laughs> for all of the books on, for, by the Kung Fu Genius. Um, and you know, Sifu David Peterson has come out with some books in recent years. But obviously, most of the Wing Chun books were written a long time ago. Sifu Leung Ting's a whole bunch of books on Wing Chun. Um, I had William Chang's books, uh, which were also from O'Hara Publications. The first one, like uh, Secret of Chi Power, I think, which was his Siu Nam Tao book. Then Advanced Wing Chun, which was his Chum Q book. And then like uh, the Deadly Fingers, the, the Buji book, the third one. I have that one, too. Um, what about Unicorn Chan? Did he come out with a book? Unicorn Chan's not a Wing Chun guy. What are you talking about? Oh, Unicorn Chan was a childhood friend of Bruce Lee's. But he's not a Wing Chun guy. No, and he died in a car accident in the Philippines. 
he was just an actor. He was just a he was just a doughy friend of Bruce Lee. <laughs> Everyone's got one of those. All right. <laughs> um, so when I was a teenager and I was just getting into like traditional classical Wing Chun or whatever, uh, you know, obviously when you're a teenager, you're attracted to things that are like a little bit different than you might be as an adult. There was one instructor uh, from Hong Kong named Stephen Chan. And Stephen Chan was a student of Chao Tzu Chun, a student of Yip Man. And Stephen Chan, he always like he had like rippling muscles and his body was always like oiled up. And he but he had these <laughs> he had these great posters. And I remember I, I got 80s them. Dude, right? He was very 80s, right? Mm -hmm. He had like the kind of 80s hair, like, but very like, you know, good looking Chinese dude. I went to Vancouver, Chinatown and he had a bunch of posters and it was him like all oiled up, like sweat, like kicking some dude in the air, him with the knives and stuff. And there was yeah. just something really cool about his presentation. And so I, uh, I had, a, I remember as a teenager, I had Stephen Chan's posters on my wall and um, he had some books called The Nucleus of Wing Chun. And basically he kind of copied Sifu Leung Cheng's Wing Chun Kun format. But I'll never forget, it was the weirdest thing for me because um, I got one of his books and like, I was so excited because I remember him from the posters and he looks super badass and everything like that. And then Chinese Kung Fu books are all kind of have like a format. Usually when you open it, there's like a photo of the author or the master. You see him there, usually some kind of cross-armed, look how badass I am kind of photo. <laughs> right, and, right. and then normally you have like a bunch of um, congratulations from other martial art instructors where they're like, you know, to Sifu so-and-so, congratulations on your new book and blah, 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 blah. And then you have the title page and so on and so forth. So there's like kind of a formula for a lot of like the bigger Kung Fu books. And Stephen Chan kind of has that formula in there. And the photo that he had of himself at the beginning. I'll never forget because it was so off-putting because I remember his photos in, in the posters, like he just looked so badass. And then I open his book and it's a photo of him in front of like a Mercedes SL, <laughs> like where he's just straight flexing. And I don't what? remember exactly, and mind you, okay, it's the 80s, so we can be a little lenient and not, everyone's, not everyone was as uh, woke and up-to-date as people are now. But he literally had a shirt on and the shirt on said like fight AIDS or no AIDS or something like that or F AIDS or whatever. Uh -huh. And it was a in the shirt was a stick figure of a dude bumping another dude from behind with a big circle and X through it like the Ghostbusters logo. Oh, and I remember yeah. it was I remember wow. seeing that and just going like <laughs> even as a teenager, you know, just going like oh, it's like when the side of your head turns yeah, up and you yeah. go like really huh? you know what i mean like like the yeah, chinese kung fu sifu like yeah, i would expect him to wear the tong jong or to wear something like you know some kind of chinese style clothing or at least just hey at least just stand in front of your mercedes sl wearing a normal ass <laughs> polo shirt all right <laughs> even the polo association the okay. not that polo mom yeah, polo yeah. right but like not this like you know like very like uh, homophobic kind of like ridiculous shit. like like what's Chinese people wears there and I remember uh, I remember seeing that and then um, going like all right I'm gonna buy the book but I'm not happy about this <laughs> and I ended up later actually normally I keep all my Wing Chun books yeah because I just I'm like a pack rat when it comes to books but I actually gave those away at some point oh, um, and so um, and, and it's not nothing about his Wing Chun or, or him or whatever but I just at some point I was like all right this is, yeah, I, I didn't want that book on my shelf <laughs> so uh, do we have time for one more question I have one more but it's from uh, Fick, Philip Jakomowski all right well let's let's go for so another Philip Jakomowski he got but. two in there somehow right. how did Bruce Lee recover? From the daily exercises. Cocaine. <laughs> ho, 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 ho. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Kung Fu Genius. And if you have any questions, anything you want me to talk about or answer, go ahead and comment below, and we'll get to that as soon as we can. And I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Gung, and I produce masters. You surpassed us, your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. Lots of, I got the secret, Yip Man's. I got the secret, I got Yip Man's secret. I got Yip Man's secret death touch book under his bed, from under his bed. Jesus. I got this. I got cut, cut him off. Secret. Cut him off. <laughs> Yip Man's secret death touch book from Yo. under his bed. What?
Why should you knock on the refrigerator before you open it? Where are you getting these jokes from? Could be a salad dressing. <laughs> I got the secret Yip Man's book. Shit. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of choy lei fat, lots of I got the secret. It's under the bed, man! It's under the bed! You almost did it in You're one take, close. you son of a bitch. So close. You and your goldfish memory. <laughs> yeah. Although, although, I suppose having a goldfish memory is better than having goldfish mammaries. That was a dad joke in disguise. Hey, 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 hey. I have a sickness. I can't stop telling jokes about the airport. Doctor said it's terminal. <laughs> oh, oh, All right, let's go. Let's oh go. God. Let's do it. I got to teach. I literally got to teach. Part? Good enough. <laughs> I got the secret yip mans. <laughs> yip <laughs> Whatever. Man. Good enough. Oh, 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 oh,